chapter 4, verse 7. Number 343, prepare the royal highway. 343 stands as one to three.
return in our hymnal to page 184, or following along on the screen for Divine Service 73. <laughs> Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. <coughs> our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And to the and to the Lord. those 
who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that they may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations and many generations. For I the Lord God, for I the Lord love justice, I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, and they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul, my soul self shall exult in my God. <clears throat> For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes what is sown to be sprouted up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were in that place to dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams. Those who sow in tears shall reap the shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The epistle reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 16 to 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from evil or from every form of evil. Now may the, Lord, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls you as faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise as we sing together the Hallelujah. and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. 
Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one that you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Having heard the word of our Lord, let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I am may be seated for our hymn of the day, the first four verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, number 357.
text for meditation comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Lyle, and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Avinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Us. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in the name of God, our Father, Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we move further along Jesus' family tree, we come to the line of kings, which begins, of course, with King David. And since most people know King David fairly well, I thought it would be good to talk about David's father, Christ's ancestor, Jesse. His name comes up fairly often in Scripture. Jesse even comes up in our hymns, two of which we sang today, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and Lo, How a Rose Hair Blooming. But how does Jesse's name come up? In these hymns we sing, Thou branch of Jesse's tree, and of Jesse's lineage. So when we sang, we actually sang about Jesse. We weren't really singing, well, talking about him, but rather the one that he was pointing towards. We were singing about Jesus, actually, who is the branch of Jesse's tree, who is of Jesse's lineage rather than Jesse himself. Something similar is actually true of the vast majority of times when Jesse's name comes up in Scripture. So instead of talking about Jesse, usually Scripture is saying the son of Jesse, or the root of Jesse. That is, the Bible is talking about King David, Jesse. not Jesse himself. And when we get down to it, we only see Jesse appear twice in the history or historical narrative of the Bible. Once when he is giving King, da or soon to be King David, some food to bring along to his brothers. And then there's also the passage I just read to you just now about Jesse presenting his sons for consideration of being anointed. So even these two times that Jesse comes up in Scripture, 
The Bible is pointing to David rather than Jesse himself. But that's okay. Jesse comes up in the Bible not to direct attention to himself, but to direct us to someone greater. King David was the one anointed by God to lead God's people, not Jesse. David was the one who faithfully wrote many, many songs, not Jesse. David is immortalized all over the Old Testament as the representation of what a Christian should be, that is, faithful to God and repenting of sin. And when the prophets talk of the coming Messiah, they often enough call this Messiah David because of the greatness of David's person. So the importance of Jesse, and the importance of David himself for that matter, is not the person in and of themselves, but rather the person that they point toward. It's all right that Jesse is not mentioned that much, or that when he is mentioned, he is just referenced in light of his son. Jesse is not following God for himself. Rather, he believes in God, and that he believes he might be saved by the one who comes after him. Jesse has faith in God that he might be saved by God's own Son, Jesus Christ, and this is enough for him. And the same is true for us in a way. We are not following God for our own importance or our own glorification. Rather, we're following God because we want salvation, fellowship, participation in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not all about you. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the one saving you from your sin, that you may live eternally, but your belief should not be out of motivation. If you were pursuing Jesus selfishly, that is, if you were only praying to God to trick God out of sending you to hell, then you are not properly living in the faith. Your outward appearance of doing good works, of the proper prayerful stature, well, that may please the eyes of man, but God looks upon the heart. God knows that in each and every one of us, too, there dwelt a heart of stone. There was a mound of granite where unconditional love should have been. And were we still possessing hearts of stone, then it would be impossible for us to love Christ selflessly through faith. But when our God blessed you with the Holy Spirit in baptismal waters, he chiseled out a heart of stone to replace it with a heart of flesh, a heart capable of bearing life, and also, therefore, the purest love, which pours out from our Lord. And the Spirit which we were given remains with us, that we might walk in the ways of the Lord, believing in Christ Jesus and loving one another as Christ has loved us. You have the love of Christ now, so therefore you can love as you should, although it may be difficult. Sometimes we become self-absorbed, set in our ways and locked into our own little world. And we look to our own needs and desires first, and to then Jesus second. One of the best examples of this actually occurs in the holiday season itself. The whole of Advent is pointing to the coming of the Christ child on Christmas Day. We see the hope of the gospel present in the manger there for us. Christ our King, prophesied of old, the branch of Jesse, the son of David, and there he dwells to take away your sins. It is a glorious thing to bathe in the light of life which shines from our Lord. Yet this thought is rarely at the forefront of our minds as we prepare for his coming. 
Our attention in December is often directed towards putting up the Christmas tree, procuring various sweets, baking, buying gifts, and scrounging around for everything that we haven't had a moment's time to do. Not to mention, say, all the cleaning and cooking that must be done to prepare for company. Regular events on your social calendar are also pushed aside as you pencil in more concerts or get-togethers or plays or, or any other holiday-themed event that comes at this time of year. All of it is busy and terribly distracting, especially when you find the pressure to buy, to bake, to celebrate, bombarding you in every flyer, commercial, and store, and pervasive email. These things make it all about you. What you have to do, what you are doing, what you must get for Christmas. So all these things about Christmas make it difficult to actually think about Christmas. The real Christmas which features the king of all creation, lying in a manger, willing to suffer and die, that you may have eternal life. We are tempted to be swept up in our own lives, to be swept up in our own self-importance in the holidays, that we shift our gaze away from Christ to ourselves and our actions. But surprise, surprise, Christmas isn't all about you. It's about Jesus. So what if you didn't get the best Christmas present ever? Christ's love and grace are still the greatest gift of all. So what if you have too much to make in the kitchen? Instead, think of how to show Christ's love. And that may actually be cooking for your loved ones. And so what if everything isn't spotless in your house? Christ has cleansed your soul from every spot and stain of sin. And you get to share this cleansing through his word on Christmas Day. We don't need to make everything about us. We're not perfect. We don't need to be Jesus. We just need Jesus. We need his love and his understanding. We need his forgiveness and cleansing. And this is what we receive from him on Christmas and every single other day of the year. He gives us exactly what we need because that's who he is. We may not be perfect, but he is. And he remains perfect, sharing his perfection before God with us, that we may stand before our Lord, not worried about uncleanliness, not worried about giving a proper gift, a proper tribute, or showing the best love that we can possibly scrounge up from a heart made of stone. All we have to do is live in the life that Jesus Christ has given us and bathe in his love. You don't need to distract yourself by striving for perfection on your own. You have Christ's perfection with you. You can let all your anxieties about Preparing the perfect thing, doing the right stuff. We can let all your anxieties fade. Because Christ takes care of you. He loves you, and love covers a multitude of sins. Even if you didn't get the right gift, bake the perfect dish, or maybe you missed a dust bunny, Christ loves you, and you can still love the people you serve this Christmas. We can let the love of Christ do what it does by simply sharing Christ's love with others. 
So instead of focusing on doing what pleases others, love them. Just love them. Show them how much you care and things will sort themselves out. Because that's what Christ did for you. Now we don't need to be Jesus. And we don't even need to be a King David. We can simply be Jesse. He led people where they needed to go. When the prophet Samuel came to anoint the king, Jesse didn't step forward saying, Oh, here I am. Instead, Jesse simply led the prophet to his sons. And we see a similar example coming up in our gospel reading with John the Baptist. People came up to him, excited. Ah, here's this guy preaching in the wilderness. He must be important, right? Are you the Christ, the promised Messiah? No. So they asked him again. Okay, well, are you the prophet Elijah sent down from heaven? No. Then they asked him, well, then are you the prophet, the one prophesied by Moses to be like a new Moses to lead the people? No. So who on earth are you, John? Well, John the Baptist is the person too imperfect to touch the Messiah's sandal. He did not pretend to be the Messiah, a prophet, or a new leader of God's people. He simply pointed to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that people may have life and love in them. That's all that we need to do. In our everyday lives, we can take a note from the humility of Jesse and John, Jesse pointed to the future Messiah, and John did the same. This is what they needed, rather than the spotlight. They needed a Savior. We do not need to make ourselves front and center. We can simply present Christ as He is, our Savior who came into this world to cover our imperfections. It's not about us. And it doesn't need to be. It's about Jesus. And thanks be to God for that. If we were left up to us, what would we have to show for Christmas except some decked halls? What Jesus shows to us on Christmas instead is a Savior born to raise us from death to new life. And that's a comforting thought. We don't need to be the renowned figures in our country, city, community, or even our own household. That doesn't matter. As long as Jesus remains in the center of our lives, giving us new life within ourselves, we have all that we need for Christmas. Amen. May the peace which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus alone. Amen. It's time I invite you to rise as we join the game together in the offertory as offerings by
of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, the God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the whole Christian church throughout the world and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this congregation, its mission and its people, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the government and all who have been set into positions of leadership throughout the world, that they may use the authority that entrusted to them honorably and for the good of all people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. <coughs> For those who are sick or infirm, especially, O oh Lord, we put before you, Margaret, Gail, and her family, Jean, Bruce, Wilfred, Ruth, Lillian, Rob, David, Laura, mm -hmm. Judith, Lynn, Paul, Queen, Eve, Noah, Honest, mm -hmm. Gloria, Courtney, Laura, and Roland. That God would grant healing to their bodies and strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who mourn, especially at this time of year, that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope but rely on God's promise that He will never leave them or forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast, the land of his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. 
Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying,
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that out of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Uh, looking further in the future, in the new year, January 6th, repose recital. So you have that to look forward to as well. And last, I believe, yeah, last thing for me is you might notice that there is a table out there with offering envelopes for the upcoming year. So please grab that uh, as, you, as you head out today. Are there any other announcements? I'll, I'll let the uh, Lord over <laughs> Yes, so we have our last midweek service this Wednesday, 7 p.m. Come early, 6 p.m. for a soup and bun dinner. Thank you. <laughs>